Kia ora koutou. Sea level rise, climate change, the impacts from earthquakes, genocide, violence, all of these things that we've seen so far in this session on disaster disruption. In a city's wounds take all kinds of forms. For Christchurch, there are the obvious wounds to the city's landscapes, the damage from the earthquakes, fires, floods, and the transformation of the landscape from the subsidence of land from the earthquakes, as we saw in Hugh's presentation earlier this morning, um, and that will be exacerbated by the rising sea levels. There are also wounds below the surface affecting the city's residents, impacting on well-being, and the relationships with the city as our home. The terrorist attacks on Friday the 15th of March this year seared into the memories of Christchurch, New Zealand and beyond. And there are other invisible wounds from the impacts of the city's traumas, including the economic and psychological impacts of events like the earthquakes and fires. Theorists of wounded cities have different perspectives on what should be done. Anthropologists Jane Schneider and Ida Sousa see wounds as something to be healed as quickly and effectively as possible. They say, Whatever the source of the affliction, wounded cities, like all cities, are dynamic entities, replete with the potential to uh, recuperate lost and recon reconstruct anew for the future. But for geographer Karen Till, the wounds come from violence inflicted on cities and their residents, and for Till, such wounds need to be kept open. Open wounds provide a necessary disruption as a means of remaining vigilant. The wound is kept open as an uncomfortable, critical space of experience, interpretation and meaning. And a wounded city is a type of trauma scape, a term coined by the cultural historian Maria Tumarkin, talking about the way in which trauma sticks to places, not to be healed, healed but to be dealt with over time. To Markin says, trauma scapes are literally everywhere. These are sites of terrorism, natural and industrial catastrophes, wars, genocide, exile, ecological degradation, communal, communal loss of heart. And she says, whether we care to look or to go to great lengths to turn away, trauma scapes persist and wield all kinds of powers and they will continue to do so until we finally take notice of them. Of course, Christchurch needs Schneider and Seuss's fix-it approach, and that's what has been happening. There are aspects of the city that need to be repaired, to be healed, and as you can see in the rebuilt city and its landscape, to be reimagined. But we also need Till's place-based ethics of care. And to Markin's concern for the trauma scape. And landscape architecture has a role in all of this. Attending to the less visible of the city's wounds from a landscape perspective can include place attachment, remembering and care. Some of the deepest wounds are from the disruption to place. There are the obvious changes to the landscape from the earthquakes, things like shag rock becoming shag pile, as well as the rebuilding of most of the city centre but there are also wounds that come from being forcibly attached from loved landscapes. The 7,000 households who had to leave their homes and relocate elsewhere. Leaving that landscape that still tended its mowing like a vast suburban garden where the residents return and place poignant markers in the trees, connections to the places that they loved to which they were attached. The fires, too, have disrupted place attachment, not a literal displacement, but a disturbance, an unsettling of what we know and love. 
I was told by someone from the health board in Christchurch that it was noted that residents from the northwest of the city, far away from the fires, were emotionally impacted. The view of the fires had destabilised their sense of place, something that often affects skylines and our attachment to the familiarity of a skyline. As the district police commander said, the Port Hills fires, even though it didn't really directly impact on a lot of people, indirectly seeing your city under threat again put a lot of people up in their anxiety states. And as we navigate the sensitive terrain of place attachment and its impacts on the city, remembering is part of the ligatures that tie us to place and our identity. There are the overt and civic dimensions of remembering with the creation of the earthquake memorial. And even with this memorial, there are less obvious dimensions to its infrastructure of remembering. For example, finding a site for the earthquake memorial. A site which was fitting because it was a place where nothing happened in the earthquake. It was neutral, calm, and not associated with any one site of, of trauma in particular. And remembering back to the competition that attracted over 300 entries from more than 30 countries. And other invisible things, like the careful process of organising the names on the earthquake memorial. There are invisible connections between the names, so that only some people will notice those connections. And other names are random, because that's how the earthquake took lives. This neutral site has now become a place that is embedded in the city, a place that supports events, remembering, and this vista of a sweep of river where the river itself is the restful water feature. This year's mosque shootings brought new wounds to the city with the loss of 51 people and re-traumatisation for many who had been through the earthquakes, including the experiences of lockdown and fear. It's still a very raw event, but the role of the landscape in creating spaces for memory and the expression of emotion immediately became clear. With the enormous tribute of flowers along the front wall of the Botanic Gardens and the Empty Shoes Memorial at All Souls Church in Merivale, where 51 pairs of empty shoes symbolised the lives lost and the taking off of shoes for prayer in the Muslim faith. The shoes challenged some ideas about memorial design and about faith. This was a memorial for Muslims at a Christian church, and it was a mobile memorial. After some time outside, the shoes were moved inside, as we just saw in, in Jamie and Shannon's presentation, that last image of the shoes inside the church, and eventually to rotate amongst the homes of parishioners who would pray for the dead. And caring, order, that word that we heard this before, very much part of, of a landscape architect's world. The manifestation of care is a critical part for dealing with wounds. The flower memorial from the mosque shooting showed this very clearly. Once the tributes had been in place for a few weeks, it was time to remove it, and this was done with the utmost care. Using some of the protocols that had been developed for tributes at the earthquake memorial and other sensitive sites, the flowers and tributes were carefully gathered up. Organic items were composted, and others were archived and have recently been exhibited at the art gallery six months on from the shootings. Caring is vital for people as well as for what theorists call the more than human, the memories, the sight, the whenua. This inclusive sense of care underpinned the principles for the treatment of the CTV and PGC sites, both places where there was significant loss of life in the earthquakes. With references to pe uh, research by people like Kenneth Foote, who studied sites of trauma in the US, and Joan Nassau's theory of cues to care, 
we shaped a set of practice guidelines for these sensitive sites. The principles included the delineation of the site, because for some, there's a desire not to enter those sites, and for others, there needs to be a reassurance that they're in the right place. And that delineation is also a bit of a force field around the site too. It's a signal to behave differently on that site. Survivor trees remain at both sites. Trees which survived the events and became symbolic in the site's narratives. And part of that whole legacy of survivor trees around the world. And also to allow for a sense of greenering greening of nature re-entering the sites. This in turn comes with aesthetic fears about the messiness of nature. So this would be framed with cues to care, like hedges. And because everything was so quickly and efficiently tidied up in Christchurch after the earthquakes, there were really no ruins which would provide a link to what happened. Only the car parks remained at these sites, and these with their messages from the past in terms of labelling, became the ruins and are carefully curated on the sites. So in conclusion, caring for a wounded city is a diverse set of practices and responses, as well as the big moves of fixing and reimagining the city are the small moves, the subtle gestures, the quiet work of caring for people memories and whenua, not simply healing and expecting people to get over it and move on, but supporting the ongoing grief, the connections to the past, the importance of identity and memory, things that are fragile and vulnerable. The city's wounds need our careful attention. Thanks.